Hello, how are you? And welcome to Josiah is Right. So if you watch this channel or if you have it all, you'll know that I'm from Pittsburgh. And being from Pittsburgh, I have an equal affection for zombies and the Pittsburgh Steelers. In 1985, just after Mario Lemieux's rookie season with the Penguins, George Romero released the end-all be-all of zombie films. Day of the Dead feels as if it were set in the last bunker with the last humans in the world and examines what remains of our humanity in an actual zombie. But of course, it all goes really, really badly. I was fortunate enough to host a screening of it as part of my film festival at the Oaks Theater, very close to where I grew up. Like George Lucas, Romero said that when he conceived Night of the Living Dead, he had too much content for one film, so he set parts two and three aside. By the 1990s, prompted by the success of Tom Savini's gory remake of Night of the Living Dead, Right around the time Lucas was going back in time with the Star Wars prequels, Romero had the itch to make part four of that zombie trilogy, or quadrilogy, or zombie saga, or zombaga, zomrilogy. As always, Romero sought to tackle larger social issues with his zombies, and he wanted to look at the issues of the day. It would be further from the zombie rising, so there'd be fewer people, but fewer zombies too, as they'd all have rotted away. And the zombies would just wander around us like homeless or AIDS victims. They'd be kind of unwanted and annoying to have about. You'd be used to them. You'd just step over them on your way to the shops. Because I figured that the 1990s were all about ignoring problems anyway. He also wanted a bigger ending and therefore needed more money. Money he had trouble finding. There were also issues involving the revenue of the previous films. But there are so many fingers in the financial pie over the previous three films that I can't see it ever happening. Hunting for money like a zombie hunts for flesh, Romero attempted to work with studios to unleash what was then being called Dead Reckoning. At the time, there was even almost a romero verse zombie TV series in the 1990s. Despite the relative success of the aforementioned Savini-directed remake of Night of the Living Dead, in the 1990s, zombies were largely out of fashion. By the middle of the 90s, they were mainly relegated to the extreme low-budget end of cinema. The Walking Dead were dead, but they weren't walking because they were going nowhere. Then along came a Japanese video game company best known for Mega Man and Street Fighter. The PlayStation and similar consoles of that generation was the first to make gaming truly cinematic. Gaming had been borrowing from movies for years anyway, but now games played like actual interactive movies. Producer Shinjin Mikami was hired by Capcom to make a PlayStation game. My apologies for mispronouncing the Japanese name. My dog is very upset with me. His previous work included Goof Troop and Aladdin, the pretty good SNES version, not the masterpiece in the Sega Genesis. They weren't looking for a blockbuster, but the video game equivalent of Oscar bait. They wanted a prestige picture, or in this case, game. They were looking to sell about 300,000 units. For comparison, Mega Man 2 sold 1.5 million copies on the NES, and Street Fighter 2 sold 6.3 million copies on the Super Nintendo. The game, which borrowed heavily in wholesale from Romero, also attempted to fix what the producer, Shinjin Mikami, saw as wrong with those films. Miyakami said, I was dissatisfied with some of the plot twists and action sequences. I thought, if I was making this movie, I'd do this or that differently. I thought it would be cool to make my own horror movie, but we went one better by making a video game that captures the same sense of terror. I want Resident Evil to give the player the feeling that he's the main character in a horror movie. In Resident Evil, like Night of the Living Dead, people flee zombies and into a house. Jill, run for that house. In the case of Resident Evil, it's a much larger house, i.e. a mansion, and the danger isn't just outside, but from the nefarious deeds performed in the deeply hidden secret laboratories inside the house. Resident Evil, known as Biohazard in Japan, sold over 5 million copies between the regular and director's cut editions. Both of which I own, so chalk two of those 5 million copies up to me. Capcom had a well-received critical darling and a 10-pole blockbuster in one game. They also had a franchise that's still ongoing with Resident Evil 7 selling nearly 8 million copies, making it the highest selling in the franchise to date. While Resident Evil became a gargantuan video game franchise that continues today, it also spawned the zombie movie boom of the early slash mid 2000s. 
Simon Pegg noted, while referring to the video game, I'd say Resident Evil is directly responsible for the renaissance in zombie films at the moment. Meanwhile, in Pittsburgh, and probably also in LA, at least for some of the meetings, Romero grew weary of working with the studio, trying to find that money. For a period of 10 years, Romero worked with New Line Cinema developing projects. However, when there are too many producers in the room, the dead projects will not walk the earth. In 1997, German production company Konstantin Film, most famous for having Roger Corman bury a terrible Fantastic Four movie, acquired the rights to make a Resident Evil film. Resident Evil. Partnering with distributor Sony Pictures and, of course, Capcom, they hired Todd McFarlane's buddy and frequent Spawn collaborator, Alan McElroy. McElroy had legit horror credentials, albeit a franchise well past its prime and well before its remake, as he broke into the industry writing Halloween 4. But his work on the Spawn comics stands out, as did his work on the amazing Spawn animated series for HBO. However, he's also responsible for the live-action version of Spawn. McElroy's version was scrapped. In 1998, Capcom reached out to Romero to make a commercial for Biohazard 2. In this instance, I'm specifically saying Biohazard because Romero's commercial, truly a mini feature, only aired in Japan. The commercial starred the late Brad Renfro of App Pupil and The Client and Adrian France of TV soap operas The Brave and the Bold and The Young and the Restless. Both titles that can be used to describe me. For US fans of both Romero and Resident Evil, the commercial instantly became legendary. Filmed in an abandoned jail near downtown Los Angeles, makeup artist Scream Mad George's desire to give the zombies a unique and distinct look and Romero's straightforward moody take majorly teased fans. To me, it seemed that Capcom was testing the waters. Get THE zombie director to make a big high budget commercial and see how things go. I personally discovered the ad and Romero's connection when the screen grabs of the commercial found their way to video game magazines. It made me hopeful for a Romero-directed Resident Evil feature. As to the game, like Dawn of the Dead, Resident Evil 2 upped the scale. Like Dawn, it also takes a rural setting and makes it suburban, swapping out the mall for a police station. Things went well enough that Romero was hired by Sony to write and direct a feature film version of Resident Evil. According to Rob Coons, director of 2013's Birth of the Living Dead, having Romero attached gave the film a stamp of legitimacy for horror fans. Back then, if you thought about zombies, you thought of Romero. His involvement guaranteed a certain number of people would come to see the movie. Not being a gamer, and well on his way to his fisherman grandpa persona, Romero watched videotape of an assistant playing the game. Did George Romero invent Twitch? After completing the Biohazard 2 commercial, and now officially on board for the feature, Romero got to writing. He wrote various drafts in the later part of 1998 through 1999. Romero wrote on his website in July of 2000, We busted balls writing drafts of the screenplay. I'm talking marathons, 72 hours straight. A short making of documentary for the Biohazard 2 commercial gives a glimpse at what the feature may have been like. With Romero explaining the threat of zombies, it's their inherent danger, as a wild animal is dangerous. Not that they are evil, they just seek to consume. The ad also gives us a clear indication of the visual concept Romero likely would have used. Romero and director of photography Peter Deming went for a noir aesthetic, what Romero called Old Hollywood. Deming was on crutches during the time of the shoot. I have no idea what happened, but crutches and a zombie horde does not bode well. Romero also gave Renfo freedom with his character. Granted, it was a commercial, so it's pretty short. But Romero was always one to give the actor space, allowing for a more natural performance. This definitely extended to the zombie performers. I find uh, you know, all the times that I've worked with zombies, if I make any physical move or talk, and all of a sudden they all do, and you have 40 zombies doing exactly the same thing. So I generally let them invent their own uh, moves. 
He also spoke about how, in his zombie films, it was those people who couldn't communicate or handle the circumstances well who became victims of those circumstances. This hints at the likely central conflict of the film. The characters would find themselves disorganized and divided in the house, where although they were previously a capable unit, the survival aspects of survival horror would overwhelm them as individuals and nefarious motives would be revealed as they explored the zombie-filled residence and discovered the truth of the zombie origin. And he said that directing the commercial had him hooked. However, things were just not going forward. Looking at Romero's script, at least the first draft, which gives story credit to Romero's producer Peter Grunwald, you totally see why he was hooked. Romero's script stays very true to the game while also changing a few key aspects. The main changes are moving Raccoon City to Pennsylvania, which I'm all for, making Chris half Native American, and two much more significant controversial changes. Before that, a quick mention of other characters. They are mostly from the game, but generally they're just soldiers who are there to die in various horrific ways. <laughs> However, Barry and Wesker stand out as men who are polar opposites, but loyal to each other due to their shared history. There's even a version of Ada Wong, which Romero describes as... Yeah... Moving on, there's also Rosie Rodriguez, very similar to Vasquez from Aliens. This is the one character who, on a very basic level, may have carried over to the final version of the film with Michelle Rodriguez's character. Back to those changes. The first being, Chris is not part of Bravo Team, and kind of a child of the forest. Not a military guy, but definitely capable of action when required. While I don't love the change, the characterization works within this script. The final change was making Jill and Chris love interest. Again, it works for Romero's story as it creates a dynamic in Jill not present in the game. A tension between her loyalty to her commander and Wesker and her duty in general against her love for Chris. But it also hurts her because Romero had a chance to make Jill a zombie version of Ripley, someone who could truly stand on her own. But the love baggage weighs her down a bit. It makes it about that and less about her. It also slows down the beginning of the film as Jill and Chris enjoy pillow talk that seriously is in need of revision or removal. When the action begins, it is all forward momentum. As others have noted before me throughout the internet, it is very much the zombie version of Aliens, and that is very much a good thing. The action is also where it stays true to the game. As you progress, things ramp up and get more intense. Unlike most of Romero's work, there is little to no social commentary in this script. It's driven by the survival horror and the action. Bernie Wrightson, who had collaborated with Romero and Stephen King on Creepshow and would go on to work with Romero on Land of the Dead, even did design work for the film. There even seemed to be a sense of urgency to get it made as Capcom wanted it for September of 1999 to coincide with the release of Resident Evil 3. Romero said of the Living Dead project, The biggest damn shame was Resident Evil. Deep in my heart, I felt that Res Eve was a ripoff of Night of the Living Dead. I had no legal case, but I was resentful and torn because I liked the video game. I wanted to do the film partly because I wanted to say, look here, this is how you do this shit. At one point in the script, Romero even tossed a little subtle or maybe not so subtle jab at the games for copying him, when after encountering a zombie, a character says, this is like Night of the Living Dead. Romero was eventually fired from the project. It seems that either Romero or McElroy's version would have focused much more on horror, based on the pedigree of both men. However, Sony clearly didn't want horror. They wanted the Matrix with zombies. Sony shifted directions dramatically in October 2000, hiring Paul W.S. Anderson to direct. While I personally hate the direction the film took, at the time, I was very much hopeful. Anderson's Mortal Kombat is silly fun that doesn't take itself too seriously, but also isn't overly jokey. Soldier, a pseudo sideways sequel to Blade Runner, featured a good script from David Peebles and an excellent performance from Kurt Russell. Finally, Event Horizon was an interesting take on interstellar horror. While none of those films hold up as classics, they're all worth a watch today. However, the promise of those three previous films was not fulfilled in Anderson's Resident Evil. My personal distaste aside, it made $102 million at the box office and sold like crazy on DVD. Anderson would go on to make like 37 million sequels as well. It's also worth noting that Resident Evil was the first big budget zombie studio film. The financial success of the film, along with the success of Danny Boyle's totally not a zombie movie, zombie movie, 28 Days Later, led to the next wave of zombies in popular culture that frankly we're pretty much still in today. That financial success led to Zack Snyder's remake of Romero's Dawn of the Dead, a House of the Dead film based on the Sega rail shooter, and even led to Romero getting the go-ahead for his long-awaited fourth zombie film, now and forever titled Land of the Dead. Land of the Dead happens to be the only movie I went to the theater by myself to see. 
Nobody wanted to go in with me. The best of the films that came from that boom was Shaun of the Dead. Prior to that, Resident Evil was referenced in Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg's Spaced. And the influence of the game was a direct line back to Romero and forward to Shaun of the Dead. A film which itself was at least in part about ignoring the homeless. A theme that Romero had hoped to explore with Dead Reckoning. Pegg said, Much of the film is about the way city people conduct their lives and ignore each other and ignore other people. In London, you can walk past someone who's dying on the street and just step over them. In some respects, that's one of the things that zombies represent. The modern zombie craze began in 1996 with Resident Evil and was bolstered by the feature film version's success. A little bit after that, even comic books got in on it. In October 2003, The Walking Dead started with the question, what happens after a Romero zombie film? And after that, 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 and so on. In September of the same year, Max Brooks released The Zombie Survival Guide. Good, bad, and mostly in between, we had plenty of zombie content, but the question remains, why in the world would they pass on Romero's script? Capcom producer Yoshiki Okamoto very bluntly stated in Electronic Gaming Monthly, Romero's script wasn't good, so Romero was fired. In an interview with British journalist Paul Whedon, Romero stated, We had a script that we thought was dynamite. Everybody loved it, except this one guy that makes all the decisions. And he had no idea what a video game was. He just had an impression of what he wanted the thing to be. So that was it. Who was this person in question? It seems it was Bernd Eichinger, who simply didn't like Romero's script. Eichinger is the guy who buried the previously mentioned Fantastic Four movie. It's Clara time. In an interview with the Directors Guild magazine, Romero said, I don't think they were very into the spirit of the video game, so I think they just never liked my script. Oddly, Akimoto said, People are trying to get the script done, but we have to be careful because it has to fit the Resident Evil feel. To me, the final movie didn't feel very much like Resident Evil. To me, George Romero's script very much did. Outside of his Pittsburgh bubble, the indie Romero couldn't conform to Sony and Capcom's wishes. He wanted to make a good movie, and they wanted to make money. Money may have also played a part in a different way. Romero's script had all the monsters from the first film. Of course, zombies, the tyrant, the hunters, zombie dogs, sharks, ravenous plants, and the giant snake. While that sounds awesome, it also sounds expensive. The Anderson film had a $33 million budget and only one monster aside from the zombies. It was highly likely Romero's script was just too expensive for Sony. Ironically, the process for making the film was the polar opposite of making the video game. For the game, Makimi was allowed to do whatever he wanted, without much input or interference from the money people. He essentially had total creative freedom. However, mainstream horror, for the most part, remains popcorn fare. Romero was just too indie and too satirical to mesh with the boardroom zombies. Adrian France said, I know George was really disappointed that he didn't do it. Still to this day, I just can't believe that his version didn't end up making it. I'm with you, Adrian. I'm with you. Thank you so much for watching this video and exploring Resident Evil with me and what could have been George Romero's version. I want to thank Penny for joining me at the end and have to say, without this book by Jim Russell, or Jamie Russell, forgive me, without this book by Jamie Russell, none of this would have been possible. I did a lot of research and found some things here and there otherwise, but most everything in here, particularly the quotes, all come from this book. I couldn't have done it without this book. So go buy this book. It does a better job than I did with this video. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Please share, share with friends, like, subscribe, and comment. Say bye to everybody, Penny. Bye. Thank you so much.